This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, welcoming you to our transcript series of Spring 2012 events. At the Military History Night of April the 18th, the well-known Canadian journalist and writer Dan Bjarnason told the little-known story of the Battle of Kapyong of April 1951, in which an Australian and a Canadian battalion held off repeated attacks by a full Chinese division and prevented a breakthrough towards Seoul. Thank you very much, uh, Pat. It's uh, uh, a delight and an honor to be here. I'm, I've become very fond of this subject, and uh, it's a little-known subject, so the more I can talk about it, the, the happier it makes me, and I hope, I hope it makes you. Before I go on, is there anybody here who's a, a veteran of the Battle of Cap Yong? I asked because I was at a gathering uh, a few months ago and the evening went on and there was a very distinguished veteran of the battle there and I didn't know that and didn't note it to my, to my shame. So I really like to get that uh, out of the road uh, first. Um, th this story, the story of Cap Yong is really, it's a mystery. Uh, I, as a journalist, I like to start out with, with a bit of a mystery and then proceed to, to solve it. So why, the mystery is, why is Camp Young so utterly unknown to, to Canadians? Why is this astounding feat of arms basically the invisible battle that's inside the Forgotten War? I've never been able to quite figure that out. If Camp Young was an American story, there would be John Wayne or Brad Pitt movies about it. Take my word for it, it's a great great American style story. It's full of heroes and peril and danger and suspense and it has a happy ending and it's full of Canadians and it's therefore full of modesty. So that's why I feel strongly about it. Also, no one knows anything about it, which is another Canadian uh, aspect to it. But why in Australia and the Australians also fought in Cap Yong. Why is the anniversary of this battle virtually a national holiday? Why in South Korea do the South Korean school kids honor Canadian war graves much the same way that Dutch school kids honor Canadian war graves there? Why is none of this the case in Canada? Cap Yong was a Canadian thermopylae. It's the heroic few against the many, except in our case, unlike the Spartans, the valiant few won. This is an Alamo in reverse. The Canadians should have been annihilated, and they triumphed. And again, it's a mystery to me why this hasn't caught the public imagination. History has a cruel way of uh, fading our memories. Korea is as far removed from us today as World War II was from the Riel Rebellion, just to give you a sense of how quickly history can go by. But Cap Yong was our pivotal battle in Korea. And I know there's going to be Korean veterans, and, and I mention this in the book, who say, and I, 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 I admit to this, that there were other battles that were the casualties were far higher, uh, the odds were far greater, but for some reason it's Cap Yong that is, has uh, uh, been retained in the memory of the few people that think of it. But it's like, you know, why, why only Cap Yong? That's like saying, why only Trafalgar? Why only Waterloo? Of all the dozens of battles that were fought against the French uh, by the English, why is there only the Trafalgar and Waterloo? Why is Stalingrad to represent the thousands and thousands of battles the Russians fought against the Why was Iwo Jima, a fly spot the Pacific, become the symbolic uh, American moment in World War II? Because there's only room in the public memory, I think, for one sort of symbolic event, and for, in my mind, for Canada and Korea, that, that moment is, is Cap Yong. Uh, like I say, it's full of it's full of terror, it's full of heroism, and it's it's full of Canadians, which why it it, it should resonate with us. Sixty years ago, uh, sixty-one years ago, actually, almost to the night, it was the twenty-third of April. Uh, a few hundred Canadian amateurs held off an onslaught of thousands of tough, seasoned, trained Chinese regular troops who had just emerged triumphant from their own civil war. This is an easy battle to follow. When I wrote this book, I didn't write it for military buffs or military historians. I wrote it for the guy or the woman sitting next to me on the, on the, on the subway. Someone who wouldn't 
care less about about military history. Somebody who wouldn't know the difference between, between a division and a platoon or a colonel or a corporal because none of that matters. If you enjoy an exciting story, Cap Yong is the story for you. It's an easy tale to tell. It lasted about 10 hours in one spot. Any kid can follow this story. Some guys were on the top of a hill and a bunch of other guys were trying to knock them off the hill. It's that simple. That's what Cap Yong's all about. It was fought on a remote hilltop at night on the edge of nowhere near a peanut-sized village called Cap Yong. The hill overlooked a vast valley, the gateway to any army who was going to move south. The Cap Yong Valley might, have, it might as well have had a sign on it saying, Invaders, come this way. It is near what is now called the Demilitarized Zone, which is about 40 miles northeast of Seoul. I don't have a map. I have a map here on the table, but I don't have one here because I, I don't think we need it. If you think of Korea in your mind, the uh, uh, Seoul is roughly halfway up, not quite halfway up. Cap Yong is about, uh, like I say, 40 miles to the northeast of that, and just a few miles from what is the demilitarized zone where the war ended and basically where the war started. So it was a day's march from, from Seoul, which is why it w was an important uh, uh, battle. Uh, on the top of this hill, there were 700, roughly, Canadian infantry, mostly, but not entirely, amateurs. They were, made, they were up against thousands of these tough Chinese veterans, fresh from their own civil war. So who were these Canadians, and how did they come to be in the Korean War? Canada formed what they called a special force for Korea. They weren't going to rely on the regular army. The NATO was just getting formed. Our obligation, our attention was paid to the defense of Europe. We were committed to helping the uh, United Nations and the United States uh, d uh, come to the rescue of South Korea. So they created a special force. These guys would sign up for a year and a half, uh, and they would all be volunteers. They were, uh, 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 some of them were World War II veterans. It's hard to say how many, maybe a quarter, but most of them were guys right off the street. They were insurance salesmen, high school kids, guys on the run from unfortunate romances, uh, uh, more than a few guys, uh, or uh, un 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 unfortunate relationships with the sheriffs in various places. Uh, they were largely, and in the best sense of the word, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, someone who knows what they're talking about, I think. Um, uh, in, the, in the best sense of the word, these guys were amateurs. A few people uh, have taken objection to my using that word, but these guys were, were amateurs in that they, they came at it as purely volunteers. This was a true people's army. The Chinese called their army the People's Liberation Army. These guys were, you know, you can imagine how much their volunteerism was. Our, our troops there were a real people's army. They were right off the streets. They signed up for 18 months specifically to fight in Korea. As long as they signed up and said, we'll see what happens, maybe there'll be a war somewhere, maybe not, they knew they were going to Korea for 18 months. The brass in Ottawa, this won't surprise you to learn how Ottawa thinks, had utter contempt for these guys. They, they regarded them, and they, they mentioned these words in their memos, their internal memos. They regarded them as adventurers and mercenaries who were just looking for a fight. They didn't have any big ideology. There was no ideolo ideological baggage with these guys. They were there because, uh, basically, of, for, for, for adventure. But the brass thought they were mercenaries. Now, you'd think that these would be exactly the kind of guys you'd want if you were getting into a war, but Ottawa didn't see it that way. The first Korean group to be established was the 2nd Battalion of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, or 2 PPCLI. It still exists today, and these guys were to become the Patricias of Capion. They were commanded by a Colonel Jim Stone, a very distinguished and brave veteran of World War II. His experience in Italy uh, proved to be a godsend in the wild and uh, barren mountains and hills of Korea. Stone was a real sourpuss, a totally grumpy, impatient, intolerant man, but he was also absolutely brilliant, imaginative, brave, and an utterly inspiring battle commander. 
Everyone said they would follow Stone anywhere, and they did. For those who argue that history is a question of the right person in the right place at the right hour, Stone is your Exhibit A. He was an unbelievably effective combat commander, perhaps the finest Canada's ever produced. So two PPCLI arrived in Korea, December 1950, about 700 of them. They sailed over on a creaky, reeking, stinking liberty ship called the Joseph Martinez, named after actually a very distinguished and honorable guy, a Hispanic-American Medal of Honor winner who was killed in the Aleutian campaign, where a Canadian native and also a Canadian Capion veteran, Tommy Prince, had also fought. He was in the famous Devil's Brigade. The voyage on this ramshackle ship, the Martinez, was a nightmare, and it was said that the only thing keeping the water out was the rust. The uh, Patricias arrived just after Christmas in uh, 1950. A U.S. military band met them on the dockside, uh, playing, if I'd known you were coming, I'd bake the cake. <laughs> to paraphrase uh, Churchill, some cake. <laughs> the Americans wanted to send these men straight to the front. There was an usual emergency, another Chinese breakthrough somewhere, and the guys were off the dock. The Americans were said, so we got to plug hole somewhere. These guys are just off the, the boat. Let's send them. Stone insisted, no. These guys have, didn't really have any training. When they left Canada, it looked like they were going to be a, just simply an occupation force, not a combat route. So they really didn't have much in the way of combat training. He said, we need six weeks to, I need six weeks to get my guys into combat shape. He raised a real stink about it, pulled out a copy of his marching orders from Ottawa, who said, I'm, I'm in command, unless there's a dire emergency, I'm in command of them. And he convinced the Americans to uh, um, give them the six weeks, uh, which turned out to be uh, vital. If they'd have gone into combat in the shape they were in, uh, the, there would have been a little bighorn type situation uh, uh, quite quickly. So the Americans uh, uh, went along with uh, Stone's insistence, to give you some idea of the powerful personality he had. And uh, the net result was that because of these six weeks, the uh, Canadian troops became extremely effective anti-guerrilla troops, uh, a tradition that uh, the Patricias carried on even in Afghanistan. The, uh, 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 the, the same units, different guys obviously, ended up in Afghanistan and were as fine as anti-guerrilla forces uh, you could want, but their roots were in the, these first weeks in, in Korea. The Chinese were now in the war, the training period now behind them, two PPCLI headed to the front, and on the way they came across this American unit that had been caught sleeping, literally. They had, the American unit had posted no sentries, they were not near the front, they thought, and they felt secure. They bedded down for the night in their sleeping bags, and they were jumped by the Chinese. They never got out of their sleeping bags. They were massacred to the man. Two PPCLI uh, were the first to come going along thinking, oh, we're going to go to the front. This would be interesting. And they're the first troops to come across these guys. To Stone, ever to see the, uh, 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 the, the chance to make a, an advantage out of an opportunity, said, there's an object lesson here. He had all his men line up and march them past the bodies of these American troops. From then on, oh, and he made his own troops turn in their sleeping bags. From now on, they were to sleep only in their clothes and in their blankets for weeks on end. One veteran told me our skin started to turn into a dark brown color after a certain amount of uh, this, uh, just sleeping in blankets. It was a miserable existence, but it meant that they would live. They would not be caught like those unfortunate Americans. Stone's men turned into, like I say, an efficient uh, anti-guerrilla force. Um, in, in Korea, uh, regular American army units, rightly or wrongly, developed the reputation for uh, 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 wanting to stick to the roads where they'd be protected by tanks, where they could get air, air cover without a great deal of trouble, and it was easier to travel. Uh, unfortunately, the enemy largely wasn't on the roads. They were up in the hills, and that's where the Patricias went. Through the early months of 1951, PPCLI, two PPCLI, chased guerrillas across hilltops and into caves. The idea in Stone's mind was, get off the roads, get up into the high grounds, and never let up on the pressure. Be unrelenting. 
This was also the uh, same aggressive style used by the American Marines who noticed the similarity between the way they operated in combat and the way the Patricias. Uh, from what I can gather, the, the Marines saw of the semblance only with the Canadian, with this particular batch of Canadian troops that they came across. Be aggressive, never let up on the enemy. In uh, mid-April, by mid-April, two PPCI were seasoned veterans. And if you look at the photos from the time, they don't look like real soldiers. You know, I, don't, I, I mean it to, as a compliment. They look more like members of Che Guevara's guerrilla band. They had a casual and misleading look of informality. They resembled in many ways the Israeli army, if you look at pictures of Israeli troops. They don't look like spit and polished troops. They're tough and they're effective, but they don't look like parade ground troops. The Israelis and the, uh, the Tupi Tzialai were, uh, despite their appearances, were imaginative, innovative, aggressive, confident, and quick learners. Arguably, uh, I'll get arguments on this, I'm sure I have for the last year, two PPCLI were the most effective Canadian troops that were sent to Korea during the entire war. They were also the most amateurish in that fine sense of the word. But many professional historians, uh, Professor uh, uh, Douglas with the Department of Defense is one, thinks these were the most effective combat troops we sent in the whole war. If you, uh, one of the tip-offs about what kind of troops they were, they instantly threw away their tin pot helmets. I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of photographs of these guys. They were issued them. I've never seen a single photograph of a Canadian soldier wearing these tin pot uh, helmets. Uh, they preferred toques or, or, or nothing. Sometimes American helmets, if they could get them, but by and large, just, just toques. Never a tin pot helmet. Many had shaggy hair. The uniforms seem almost makeshift. If it was comfortable, wear it. By and large, they preferred their Canadian-issue winter clothing to anyone else's. No surprise there. The winters are what makes Canadians Canadians, so we should have good winter clothing. They were quite happy with that. But they much preferred American weapons and American boots. They were sent to war, the Canadians, with absolutely the wrong weapons for this particular war. The main small firearm, as I'm sure most of you know, was the Lee Enfield, a tough, uh, reliable, accurate rifle, but it's a repeating rifle. Every time you want to fire a bullet, you have to work the action, uh, load the chamber, and uh, the, the Canadians wanted, and the Chinese had, automatic weapons, which means they shoot as long as you pull the, pull the trigger. Or they preferred, if they couldn't, yeah, that, that kind of weapon, uh, weapons like a rifle like the American uh, uh, famous M1, which uh, uh, each time you pulled the trigger, a, a separate shot went out. They had clips, but you didn't have to cock the action. No need for recocking. Uh, and these were the types of weapons, either automatic weapons or semi-automatic weapons. This is what you needed when the enemy was going to be right on top of you, swarming into your foxhole at night, as they were to do at Cap Young. Every chance they had. Canadians traded their beer and other liquids for American automatic weapons, especially the so-called Tommy guns, made famous in all those Chicago gangster movies. The uh, Chicago gangsters knew a thing about which were good weapons. Uh, Stone, uh, Colonel Stone, uh, personally and oddly preferred the Lee Enfield. He's almost the only person I come up that I've read about who did prefer the the the, the Lee Enfield, and. Uh, uh, like I said, Canadians did a lot of trading with Americans' beer for weapons, and Stone disagreed with this early form of a Canadian-American free trade agreement. Uh, nonetheless, he turned a blind eye to it. He was a firm believer that men must have uh, uh, confidence in their weapons. What weapons exactly, he didn't prefer to know about. Um, Mike Levy, one of the heroes of Cap Young later in the battle, and I'll, I'll re refer to him at some length, um, had a personal weapon as a Tommy gun. No one quite knows where he got it from. It was Chinese made. Haven't a clue how we came across that. So let's get to the battle. April 22nd, uh, the Chinese staged another offensive and breakthrough UN lines. The Patricias were in a rest area a few miles, four or five miles uh, from the front. The battalion, talk about an opportunity missed. The battalion photographer, and there was such a thing, was on leave in Tokyo. The unit was on rest, 
photographer gets leave, he goes to Tokyo, and so there are no photos of the battle. And the photographer misses out on the assignment of a lifetime, as I'm sure his mates told him for the rest of his career. So the Patricias were pushed forward, hearing of this Chinese uh, breakthrough, to plug the growing hole in the line that the Chinese had punched. Stone placed his men atop, naturally enough, high ground. Uh, on the map it's called Hill 677. I'm the only one in the world that calls it 677. Everybody else calls it Cap Yong. Uh, it's near the village of Cap Yong. This is about a day's march from Seoul. Stone went forward when he got there slightly ahead of his troops. He went forward to scout out ground that would soon be held by the Chinese, and he looked backwards over his shoulder. He wanted to analyze how he would attack his own position if he was in the, in the Chinese shoes, and he then deployed his, his men accordingly. These were lessons Stone picked up when he was in, in Italy. Put yourself in the enemy's shoes. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, but it's surprising how many people don't do it. Stone did it. So he went out, reconnoitered the, the ground, figured out how I'd attack myself, then when I became myself, and here's how I'd defeat myself. As the battle unfolded, I don't have a map, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, to understand. The two PPCLI were in a perilous position. They were exposed, and they were surrounded, and they were outnumbered. To their front, a South Korean unit virtually imploded. About 10 miles to the left, the British Gloucesters, after a desperate fight uh, and a valiant fight, were virtually wiped out. And to their right, by a couple of miles, an Australian unit, 3RAR, were driven off their hill after ferocious fighting. The Canadians watched in horror knowing that now they were basically surrounded, they had no support on their flanks or to the front, and that their turn was coming next. And if Cap Yong fell, the Chinese would be a day's march to Seoul, and uh, it was only the Canadians that, that uh, blocked the way, these outnumbered Canadians who'd never been in a, in a formal battle before. They'd been in skirmishes with guerrillas, but not a set-piece battle. So on the night of April 24th, this is 61 years ago virtually, they could hear the Chinese trumpets. The battle for Cap Yong began around 9 o'clock. Here they were, outnumbered, outgunned, and surrounded, and here's how the battle would unfold. Two PPCLI were deployed into four companies. You don't really need to know any of this stuff. This is what I keep telling my wife and others. So you don't, none of this matters. But anyway, there were four companies, uh, and they were deployed in an, in an arc. Uh, shaped like a boomerang uh, uh, to the right, uh, from starting at about 10 o'clock over to 3 o'clock. Two of these four companies were never attacked, so we can forget about them. So we only have to keep track of two companies, the one at 10 o'clock, the 10 o'clock, and the one over at 3 o'clock. This means we're looking at about four or five hundred men. We're up against perhaps four or five thousand men. Nobody knows exactly how many Chinese there were or how many Chinese casualties there were. I uh, asked the Chinese embassy at the time when I was doing my book for some anything, any statement, any figures, anything. Not a reply. What a surprise. Occasionally, uh, these guys, uh, our Can the Canadians, saw uh, glimpses of the ch Chinese uh, silhouettes in the moonlight. Uh, they were wading across down a river below. One Patricia thought, as he, as he looked at it, almost like a poet, uh, he said, uh, these Chinese troops look like Roman legions, advancing, advancing, advancing. Imagine his heart was going like, like a locomotive. Uh, when Stone was told that the Chinese were finally on their way, apparently he just sat in a chair at his headquarters, outdoors. He rocked back and forth in his chair with his rifle in his lap and he said, let the bastards come. Uh, that doesn't sound like a John Wayne line. Uh, you know, uh, but he, th th there's so many people who've heard him say that. Uh, it, it, it has to be so. But it's entirely in keeping with Stone's makeup that he would say a thing like, like they were bothering him. I'm busy here tonight and now these Chinese are coming to bug me. Uh, Stone uh, had ordered there would be no attempt at breakout, no position would be abandoned, they would dig in on Cap Yong and fight it out. There was an American uh, Civil War general, and it may have been General Meade, who was the victor at uh, Gettysburg, who said that all a commander can do is basically get his troops to the front. 
From that point on, everything's in the hands of the soldiers. Will they fight or not? That was basically Stone's idea. I've got my men here. I've deployed them. The Chinese are coming. It's up to them. And he had faith in them. And, um, well, we can see what happened. Each company, because of the nature of the hills, each company had to fight on its own uh, in the dark. Uh, because of the t- t- topography, the hills were more or less cut off from each other, so they couldn't support each other and couldn't see each other. And in some cases, the uh, platoons couldn't even see physically their 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 uh, their company commanders. So, uh, to a large extent, there would be a, a series of small, they weren't so small if you were on the receiving end, separate battles. There was no mutual support. The first assault was against B Company on the extreme right. That's the one kind of over here. There was ferocious fighting as the position came under mortar and machine gun fire. Uh, some units, some uh, platoons ran out of ammunition and the, the fighting developed into hand-to-hand combat in foxholes using grenades and shovels and bayonets and rocks and swearing, believe it or not. One man, uh, out of ammunition, threw his bayonet-tipped rifle like a spear and impaled an enemy coming at him uh, out of the shadows. There's lots of stories of this kinds of things happening. You could only see maybe 30 or 40 yards in front of you. So whatever was coming at you, you would see at the last minute. The different Guys remember things differently. Some of them, I would, I would say, was it a, a full moon or not? Some guys remember a full moon. Some guys said, I, don't, I have no idea. I, I don't remember a moon. In fact, the, the, there was a full moon and it came out at midnight. I'd say, what, was it noise? Could you hear other people? Some guy said, I could hear nothing but noise. Other guy said, I, I, I heard nothing at all, except maybe guys a few foxholes away saying, look out, watch it, here they come. So it's odd where people have completely different recollections of, uh, I guess it's not odd if you've been through it, but uh, it, it, it strikes me as curious that people have different, and it's not that we remember it differently, they just remember different things. Um, some sections were overrun and then retaken. Later there were two men, Privates Evan and Tolver. Um, their bodies were found together. One of them was still gripping his rifle. His bayonet stuck in a Chinese body. The dead Chinese had his rifle stuck in Evans. One of the Canadians rifles, I'll get to this later, one of the dead Canadians rifles had the name Lydia carved in the stock. Then the Chinese, that attack more or less petered out. They didn't know it at the time it had petered out, but it, it petered out. So the Chinese switched objectives. They swung, and they swung, or swung around to the south, kind of underneath them, where there was a small unit, a mortar and machine gun uh, uh, unit, and the Chinese were going to sweep underneath them, and this would be the way they would try and get at uh, battalion headquarters. Naturally, if they took the headquarters, the whole thing would be would be gone. Uh, they these people were met by fire uh, from the from mortar and machine guns under the cana- under the command of a uh, young lieutenant called Hub Gray, who was one of the unsung heroes of uh, of Capion. Uh, Gray's men were fighting at extremely close range. They broke up this onslaught against. Uh, the company headquarters. Gray's machine gunners, one of them told me later, sprayed gunfire at the enemy and swept them away like water from a hose. If this, if Gray's men had failed or had been swamped, the headquarters would have uh, fallen uh, and the uh, 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 hill probably would have been lost. But Gray's men held and uh, headquarters uh, did not fall. Hub Gray spoke here about five or six years ago. I don't know if any of you remember that. He wrote a book uh, on his own uh, uh, about about his account there, and he was a, a tremendous assistance to me when I was working on this. Okay, that's uh, that's. Um, there was the attack on the on the right. There was attack on the on the company headquarters. Then there was the final attack, although no one knew it at the time. This would be the final attack. It was against D Company, which was exposed out on on the extreme left, looking north. They were really exposed. Most of the guys were cut off. These guys were really cut off. Uh, and this attack began about midnight, so we're about three hours into the battle. So intense were the attacks on this position that it was on the verge of going under. And a young uh, lieutenant called uh, Mike Levy, lieutenant of 10 platoon, called in artillery fire from supporting uh, New Zealand uh, gunners. 
Uh, he called in artillery fire on his own positions. If D Company had gone under, so probably too, again, would the uh, 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 headquarters and the entire hill and the Chinese would have been on their way to Seoul. Like Gettysburg, Cap Yong is filled with moments when everything seemed to hinge on a single event. The single events came one after the other. Like Wellington said after Waterloo, this would be a very close run thing. At any rate, uh, Levy calls in artillery fire on his own positions, breaks up the Chinese attack. Firing continued uh, sporadically through the early morning, but the uh, attacks eventually failed away. The worst was over for now. But the Canadians were out of almost everything. They were out of ammunition. They were out of food. They were out of medical supplies. Uh, one guy, who was the, the only sort of guy that had any kind of foresight with them, took because they were all rushed into the front in a, in, a, in, a, in a hurry with no time to plan it. He just crammed a whole bunch of chocolate bars uh, into, his, uh, into his kit. And uh, that's what kept him going, much to the envy of uh, the other chalk barless comrades he had. Uh, at any rate, the, the guys had run out just about everything. At about 4 o'clock in the morning, Stone radios for a supply drop. And in a really remarkable feat of logistics, the American Air Force put together a, uh, a rescue package. They loaded up flying boxcars, C-119s, and flew them straight from Japan to the skies over Cap Yon. And when they arrived, uh, only about six hours had passed between Stone's original radio call and the planes arriving over. And that's so all that loading up, navigating, flying over, and dumping the stuff from the backs of the planes happened uh, within six hours from the initial call to help to the airdrop. It's just an unbelievable uh, uh, logistical accomplishment. In a Hollywood movie, down on the ground, when these planes came over, there would have been cheering and hoorays, and we've got them, and uh, this type of thing. At Cap Yong, there was no cheering. The men just sat there, sat there, and they stared up. They were silent and grizzled and red-eyed. One man described the planes to me as tiny silver fish. Another said that the planes were beautiful. It was as if they were flown by angels. To the Patricias atop their shell-blasted hill, surrounded by dozens and dozens and dozens of the slain Chinese, these airdrops meant that at last they weren't alone. They would not die after all, or at least they wouldn't die today. The gunfire slowly died down. The Chinese had had enough for now. They vanished. The siege was over. The Canadians were relieved the next day. And that essentially was Cap Yong. But there's other things to talk about. It was, by any standard, a remarkable feat of arms. The Chinese deaths were maybe 3,000. No one knows. This is due to uh, the uh, small arms fire from the Patricias, mostly using Bren guns, mortar fire, uh, New Zealand artillery, some American artillery. Uh, but the Chinese deaths were maybe 4,000. We don't really know because they hauled away a, a lot of their dead. So the ones they didn't haul away were the ones that they couldn't get at, the guys basically in the Canadian trenches. The Patricias had 10 killed and 23 wounded. This is a tragedy for sure for the families and friends of those 10 slain, but it's an astoundingly small number for the ferocity of the battle. The fight received almost no coverage in Canadian newspapers at the time. Isn't that a mystery? The big story in the Globe and Mail the next day was Con Smythe saying the Maple Leafs were the best they'd ever been. Yeah, exactly. That's true. That's true. That's right. What a, what a prophet. Maybe their judgment was right in the Globe and Mail. This was a bigger event than Papillon. <clears throat> the Canadians, on the other hand, uh, the Americans, I'm sorry, on the other hand, did take notice. They awarded the two PPCLI a presidential citation from President Truman. This is uh, the only Canadian unit that's ever been given this honor, although we fought, I think, four or five wars together, the Americans, the uh, two PPCLI and the Americans. This is the only time uh, a Canadian unit has got the presidential citation. It's an honor. It's a, it's a little kind of blue uh, uh, ribbon uh, they wear on their, on their shoulder. Maybe it's the shoulder. It's an honor they still wear today on their uniforms. I'm sure it will surprise no one that follows the way Ottawa works that Ottawa refused to let the unit wear this honor. They said it was a breach of protocol. 
and uh, you know the Americans hadn't asked permission um, the, the Australians and uh, a British unit uh, the, the Gloucesters are also given uh, uh, presidential citations under the same circumstances and the British didn't and the Aussies didn't worry about us uh, uh, decorum they just said we're honored thank you Canada said, Ottawa said, no, 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 it's not the way it's done. So it wouldn't let them accept this. And five years went by. And it took the intervention and public, uh, had to be, uh, public stink had to be made by Lady Patricia Montbatten, the daughter of Lord Montbatten, who was then the honorary uh, colonel in chief of, uh, of the Patricias. She had to go public and say, my God, Think of what you're doing. These guys have earned it. The Americans don't do this every day. And finally, Ottawa, after five years, came to its census. And uh, uh, today, like I say, PPCLI remains the only Canadian unit to receive this honor from an American president. And I wonder if the Americans just didn't want to go through all this humiliation again of honoring uh, Canadian soldiers, only to have the, uh, the gesture uh, rejected and spurned of why it's uh, not happened again. It's sort of uh, familiar of the story of the Canadian snipers. Afghanistan, or the Americans decorated, and da 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 da, -da. and uh, so nothing changes in, in history. At any rate, if you ever see a guy wearing uh, the blue patch on his shoulder today, he's with two PPCLI, and it's a heritage of. Uh, okay, he's in the same unit, obviously not the same guy, but he's in the same unit that fought at Cap Young. Uh, two PPCLI, originally formed for just uh, this 18-month Korean stint, was not disbanded once the 18 months were over. Uh, it still exists. It's based in Camp Shiloh, Manitoba, about uh, half an hour's drive from my hometown in Brandon, Manitoba. And just last uh, April, uh, they invited me to attend their 60th uh, anniversary commemorating uh, uh, Cap Yong, at, uh, that they had this anniversary at, uh, at Camp Shiloh. It was quite honored and, and it was quite thrilling. And there were a few uh, Cap Yong veterans at it. At any rate, two PPCI still exist based in, uh, based in Shiloh, Manitoba. Cap Yong today, the place, is uh, covered with trees and bush. At the time, it was a shell blasted uh, moonscape. There's a memorial at the base. But the hill itself is wild and deserted, and no one lives there. Uh, hardly anyone walks over it now, although you can still find traces of foxholes and uh, sometimes bayonets and bits and pieces of rifles and uh, uh, shell casings. Uh, it's not like uh, Gettysburg, say, where there's monuments and guided tours. There's nothing at Cap Yong. You'd have to be. To think that veterans of Cap Yong could tour the battlefield is absurd. They can't do it. I mean, it, you know, uh, people in their 30s uh, have a tough time doing it because it's bush. It would be like de deer hunting territory up around Sudbury. It's just absolute barren wilderness. Uh, so th there's a place where veterans can go, a kind of a mo monument, memorial at the bottom of the hill, but it's not, nothing it's, it's nowhere, well, it's near, but it's not close by where the actual fighting comes. But if you're there and you have the uh, tenacity, you can walk through, you can sit in the foxhole. Um, the, the, uh, the, there was a, a young, John Bishop was a young lieutenant at Cap Yong. Later on in life, became Canada's military attaché in South Korea, quite an interesting military career. And he used to go out to Cap Yong and prided himself on, he's now head of the Korean Veterans Association, and he used to go out and he cried himself at it in his 40s and 50s. He could still, he could find his foxhole and still fit into it. <laughs> I couldn't fit into it, but uh, John looks today like he did 61 years ago. There is a Canadian called Ivan Duguay who teaches English at a South Korean university who's made a hobby of hiking and photographing and mapping with his GPS the Cap Yong battlefield. Uh, I've dealt with him over the phone and uh, on the internet, and uh, he probably knows the terrain better than anybody, including the guys who fought there, about the place. Uh, his, uh, uh, he sent me, he said, I'm gonna, I'll go out there for you uh, and take some pictures. And he went out, this was to be about uh, two weeks before Christmas, and uh, a blizzard hit, and he went out, spent a day there, and took photographs for me. He sent me 70 photographs. Uh, that I, I put on a, I, I do a blog on this and I put them on the, on, on the blog. Anyway, his current project is to, uh, with his GPS, to find the place where Mike Levy made his stand, Mike Levy of, uh, of, of 10 platoon. Because there's nothing, no markers, there's no nothing. Um, 
Uh, as an indication of the ferocity of the fighting at Cap Yong, there were five decorations for bravery that were awarded. This is a large number for a small outfit in a, in a short battle. Uh, Stone, when the guys were spent worse to Korea, Stone, Mr. Happy Face, said, no one in this unit's going to get any medals. I don't believe in it. He, he who'd already earned two or three decorations in World War II said, I don't believe in medals. I think you guys are professionals. You do what you do because that's why you do it. So I don't believe in medals. Okay, five medals were given uh, at uh, Cap Yon. Stone got one of them. Uh, he was, uh, he, he, it was twice he was decorated in World War II. He decorated again at Cap Yon with a distinguished service order. I don't mean to be flippant about Stone. I mean, he, he earned every single commendation and, and uh, good word uh, that's ever been uh, said about him. Um, anyway, he got a, a, a distinguished uh, service order. Uh, a little bit about Stone. Shortly after Cap Yong, Stone was informed that his daughter, who had eye cancer, had died. So he would have known all through the build-up to Cap Yong that this was around the corner, this incredible burden on him, and he just managed to compartmentalize it, get on with his job, and shortly after the battle, uh, she passed away back in Canada. After the war, Stone went on to become head of the military police, actually, and he created a fund staffed by uh, military police volunteers. This is a fund that still exists, which raises millions of dollars to help blind children in Canada. It's the only official military charity in the country, and Stone regarded this fund, not Cap Young, as the greatest accomplishment of his life. Stone uh, died, incidentally, in Victoria in 2005. Very few of these guys are still with us. Some are, but very few. Uh, anyway, it shows where Stone's mind was. The, the, the battle meant nothing to him. He was a professional. He, this is what he's paid to do. He did it. What really mattered to him was this fun for blind children that still exists. So next time you think a bad thought about MPs, not members of parliament, military police, think of Stone and these volunteers that raised money for blind kids. Captain Wally Mills, the commander of B Company, this was the last unit to be attacked, got a military cross. Mills died in 1995. Ken Barwise got a military medal for recapturing a machine gun, killing many, many enemy soldiers at close range and running a gauntlet of fire to deliver ammunition. Barwise is, again, if he was an American, there'd be some kind of movie, an Audie Murphy movie about him. Uh, Barwise was made, uh, raised as an orphan. He did a stint in reform school. He was a school dropout. I don't think he got into high school. I think he got to about grade seven or eight. He wasn't a stupid person. It just he wasn't. He just didn't get beyond grade school. He sailed the world on Gramps, tramp steamers. He was a, a ruthless, a ruthless and very troubled young man. But the Korean War changed his life. He signed up for the special force, made the army his home, and he stayed in it for 30 years. Uh, he was a very popular soldier, and his night on Cap Yong made him a memorable one. He died in uh, 2008 on the West Coast. Wayne Mitchell won the Distinguished Conduct Medal. I think this is second only to the Victoria Cross. Mitchell was about this high and had more meat on him than this, this scrawny little gangly kid. You'd never think of using him in a recruiting poster. Uh, Wayne Mitchell gets the Distinguished Conduct Medal. He uh, uh, repeatedly, although repeatedly wounded, blazed away single-handedly at enemy soldiers to prevent his company from, uh, from being overrun. His citation reads like something from Hemingway. It's got phrases in it like this. Exposed himself to enemy fire again and again. Firing from the hip, refused to be evacuated, could hardly stand for loss of life. Mitchell was 19 years old and, like I say, a skinny little pipsqueak of a guy. He said when he, uh, when he was awarded his uh, decoration that he was more terrified uh, at that moment than he was at the height of the battle. Anyway, Mitchell's a re they're all remarkable guys. He's, a, he's particularly remarkable. He died in 1999. Then there's Smiley Douglas. I've I've talked to Smiley Douglas a long time, uh, uh, many times. Uh, uh, he's uh, an amazing guy. He was awarded the military medal. 
A live grenade. This is again right out of an Audrey Audrey Murphy uh, Audrey Murphy movie. A live grenade tumbled in the midst of his platoon. He reaches down to pick it up, starts to toss it, goes off in his hand. It's like a nanosecond too late. So it blows his hand off, but he saves his comrade. Smiley, what a name, Smiley Douglas, still lives in southern Alberta uh, on a farm, on his family farm. He's as modest today and as unputdownable an optimist as he's ever been. He's, there's not a trace of bitterness in him. A young guy, 19, 20 years old, farm boy, loses a hand, big deal. Didn't matter, but it mattered, but he came to grips with it. Uh, he, I asked him about his medal. He says, ah, he keeps it in a drawer somewhere. Didn't know exactly where. It's in a drawer around here somewhere. Uh, as for his short career in the Army, his short tragic career in the Army, he says, was the best time I had in my life. And what a guy. It's just uh, an amazing fellow. Um, uh, it, 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 it always strikes me that these aren't the, the unreality of some of these stories, it does strike me there's something from a movie. But these are things real people did, and real people that are just like, they, they were, they, there was nothing unusual about them other than the unusual circumstances they, they found themselves in, and the sense that there was a world beyond them. There was a larger, I mean, to throw yourself on a grenade that's when you're really not thinking of yourself. You're really thinking of something larger. But I think all of these kind of guys had that in mind. Uh, and these are, these, it strikes me that these, this is one of the unfathomable things about Cap Young and why it re remains sort of the, the perfect example of the perfectly fought defensive battle, and yet it's virtually unknown to most Canadians. The folks back home barely noticed uh, the Korean War, or, or, or Cap Yon. When, when some of these guys would come home, people would say, well, where have you been? Like, you know, like you've been to Winnipeg for a week. Where have you been for the last year and a half getting almost killed? Uh, the Korean War started being forgotten when it was still on. There were, by the end of the war, people were scarcely aware that it was on. One uh, Cap Yon veteran, Don Hibbs, who's still alive, told me that when, when his guys returned, uh, he was in two PPCLI, on a Cap Yon, when his guys returned, uh, when the boat docked in Vancouver, uh, the only people that met them at dockside were gangsters who wanted to buy their rifles. There were no bands, girls with flowers, nothing, just these mobsters. Then there's the, uh, the mystery of uh, Mike Levitt, the young lieutenant from 10 Platoon, D Company, responsible for calling in the artillery fire on his own position. Now, Levy is a character right out of Terry and the Pirates, if you remember that comic strip from the, from the 50s. He was the son of a British geologist. He grew up in Shanghai. When the Japanese invaded, he, uh, the family was interned. Uh, and, and the camp they were interned in became the subject of a Steven Spielberg movie, Empire of the Sun, actually, quite a well-known uh, movie, one of Spielberg's early movies. Anyway, the family's turn, uh, um, Levy, 18 years old, escapes with a couple of other guys. They uh, go, they, they link up with Chinese guerrilla bands, cross China by junk and rickshaw and gorillas hiding them. These teenagers, basically, cross China, link up with an American Air Force unit that was flying the hump over the Himalayas, who fly them to India, where he joins the special operation executive, the We Blow Things Up guys, of the British uh, uh, commando force. He uh, parachuted back in behind the lines uh, in, uh, in uh, Malaya, fought with some of the people with them were uh, uh, Chinese Canadians who were recruited into the special force and through them he got to know about Canada. So he fought with alongside these guys in the anti-Japanese anti uh, guerrilla uh, bands. Uh, now remember he's like 19 years old and he's, been, he's got about four wars under his belt. He ends up in Vancouver, gets into the restaurant business at 20, that goes broke. He discovers, well, maybe restaurants isn't my business, a line of work, maybe soldiering is. Korean War breaks out, he joins up, finds himself in Korea, finds himself in Cap Yong. He had recruiting poster good looks, uh, spoke Mandarin, had initiative and imagination, was a natural leader, and very, very brave. I have some photographs behind me on a table here of, uh, 
of, uh, of a few things from Cap Yong, including a few of Levy, uh, one of them uh, holding a beer bottle, and no surprise, and one of them holding a Thompson submachine gun. So those were the two things that kept Mike Levy happy. Anyway, I've got pictures. He looked like a recruiting poster. He was a dashing guy. Anyway, he's passed over for, for a medal at Cap Yon. This is the guy that calls in artillery fire on his own position. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows he raised his sleeve, saved the day. Lots of guys saved the day. He was the last guy to save the day. No medal for Levy. A half century later, Hub Gray who probably should have been decorated himself for saving the battalion headquarters, came up with an explanation of the Levy mystery. Gray found and interviewed a soldier who'd overheard Stone say, after the battle, when the question of Levy's heroics came up, I will not award a medal to a Jew. Remarkably, Levy remained a deep admirer of Stone and declared that he'd follow the man anywhere. Even more remarkably, Stone, perhaps in contrition, after Cap Yong, made Levy his intelligence officer, which is a position, as many of you know, of, of great trust. So it's a real conundrum what to make of this facet of Stone's makeup. The whole episode remains baffling. There was not a whit of anti-Semitism in Stone's makeup before or after this, this incident, but there you have it. It's like Ulysses Grant's inexplicable outburst against Jews in the American Civil War. Never preceded him, never happened after it, inexplicable when it did happen, and it remains a disturbing and enigmatic feature in uh, the makeup of uh, two great men. It's, uh, it, I've done a lot of reading on this, and it just it, it baffles me, but there it is. So, Levy's heroism went unrecognized, for a half a century until 2003 when the then Governor General Adrian Clarkson recognized this injustice to Levy and granted Levy a coat of arms specifically for his valor at Cap Yong. And I deal with this at some length in my, in my book. And in her kind introduction to my book that uh, uh, Madam Clarkson wrote, she referred to the Levy story in what she terms its sad complexity. She doesn't go into a lot of details, but she alludes to it by this phrase, Levy's sad, the sad complexity of Levy's uh, role at Capion. Uh, Madam Clarkson, incidentally, today is the uh, honorary uh, colonel in chief of the Patricias. She was, I think, 12 years old at the time of Capion. Uh, she had her a, a best friend at school, a school chum, and her brother was killed in Korea. wasn't killed at Capion, but was killed in Korea, and he was a poster, handsome guy, and died in combat, but the, the brother of her best friend died in Korea, so she's had this, att attraction isn't the right word, she's had this draw to the Korean War her entire life, but she's uh, particularly, so anything connected with Korea, she's colonel in chief, of the, like I say, of the Patricias, and especially the Korean War, and the Cap Yong, and the, the Levy incident, she's particularly drawn to. Next time you see Adrian in the news, you might think of her in that context. In the years that followed, Stone gave conflicting views on Cap Yong. It wasn't a great battle as battles go, he said at one point. But then at another point, is there an absurd thing for him to say? It wasn't a great thing as battles go. Uh, at another point, minutes later, he said affectionately about his men. This is not an affectionate man. This is what Stone said about him. Their favorite marching song had a refrain, we are untrained bums, we're from the slums. They were just a wonderful group of men. It's hard to think of Jim Stone using a word wonderful, but there you are. He said, they were a wonderful group of men. They believed in me, and I believed in them, and what is more important, they believed in each other. In ways, this tells you more about the effectiveness of combat units. It's not so much about weapons or propaganda or uniforms or equipment. If, if the ingredient of, of the, the troops to, uh, isn't there, their, their, their belief in each other isn't there, it really doesn't matter what else is there if that crucial first ingredient isn't there. Anyway, I love that quote. They were a wonderful group of men. So if you talk to Capitol veterans today, those who were left, uh, they would be young men. If they were, if they were, you know, if they were 20 in Cap Yong, they're in their 80s now. 
Um, they're likely to say that trapped or not, it simply never dawned on them at Capion that they couldn't pull it off. John Bishop, uh, who I referred to earlier, the young corporal of Capion, later the military attaché, said, we just told ourselves that we're going to stay here, we're going to fight, and we're going to make it. Private Bob Menard helped recover the dead after the battle. He noticed when, when he, that they came across the bodies of the slain that no one died singly or alone. They all went down in little groups of two. He said, they died in their foxholes. They'd gone down fighting. We always found them two together. They were defending each other to the end. I mean, that's pretty close to poetry. You know, they were defending each other to the end. There's something very Canadian about Capion, the heroism and the modesty. It was an amazing triumph. Douglas MacArthur thought so. He said something to think you guys did a spectacular job. Uh, like our country, Capion says, we're in this together. Cold logic says that it shouldn't work, but if we believe in it, then it will work. The Capion Patricias believed they were simply the best soldiers on the hill that night, and they were right. There were some loose ends. As far as I can tell, the men of uh, Capion never got to meet any of those American flyers that flew the drop planes. They said they wanted to, but it just it, 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 they didn't happen. They never got to link up with the guys who saved their lives. There's no official photograph of, uh, there, are no, there are no photographs of the fighting at Capion. It was an un, uh, uh, a night battle. Like I say the photographer was on leave. Um, one man is said to have made a Kodak home movie and filmed portions of the fight that night. He sent it back to uh, Vancouver to be processed, and it never surfaced. Never turned up anywhere. Um, the man has since passed away. I've tracked his daughter down. She says that her basement is full of her dad's army stuff from the Korean War, but she's no idea what's in it and shows no interest in finding out. So, sadly, somewhere in a cardboard box in a British Columbia basement, there could be unseen footage, more than a half century old, of the fight at the Cap Yon. I really wanted to, I'm um, just winding up now, I really wanted to, uh, this sounds like a simple thing, uh, but it involves uh, federal bureaucracy, so you know in advance it's not going to be simple. I wanted to be able to list the names of the ten guys killed at Cap Yon. Um, it was important to me, but amazingly, no such list existed. Everybody knew there were ten. The guys' names were scattered throughout uh, the, the casualty lists of the Korean War generally, but they weren't ever brought together in one place as Cap Yong killed. So I asked the army, could you please tell me those ten names? So I wanted to honor those ten names by listing them one by one. Now, I spent 30 years working for one of the most intense bureaucracies on the planet, so I thought I knew how they worked. I was wrong. The army told me they couldn't give me the names of the men who died 60 years ago because I didn't have the proper security clearance. <laughs> Isn't that uh, believable? Uh, and I, I finally got the names by interviewing enough veterans, going over their own individual lists, cross-checking things, but the Army didn't say, we don't have the list or anything like that. They said, no, 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 you, oh, you could be a terrorist, or well, who knows what you do with those ten names. Anyway, they said, I didn't have the, the, the security clearance to know the names of guys who killed six decades ago. So, as far as I can tell, my book, little pat on the back to myself here, is the only time their names have been brought together in one spot. And to anyone who wants to use this information, I grant you my personal security clearance. <laughs> Uh, what happened to the uh, other guys, uh, the other the two little uh, stray ends here? The Joseph Martinez, the unloved, uh, leaky, stinky uh, troop ship, named after the first Hispanic American to get the Medal of Honor, uh, posthumously. It was mothballed in 1951, scrapped in 1971. It was an unlamented passing. But American Legion posts uh, and streets and statues still exist across the American Southwest, named in honor of this uh, slain war hero, Joseph Martinez. And finally, 
I opened on a mystery, oh, closed on a mystery. I've often wondered, remember Lydia? I've often wondered, who was Lydia? Her name was carved on that dead Patricia's rifle. I never solved this mystery. I wondered what became of her. Did Lydia ever learn what happened to her young hero on Cat Yong that night 61 years ago? Thank you very much. For the web transcription service of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye and thank you for listening. Podcasts of other RCMI lectures in the 2012 season are also available on the website now, so please join us again soon.